Hello, and thank you for watching the second part of the series in which we look at the reasons for the contention that exists between believers who regard the Bible as the Word of God. In the previous video, we looked at how some apparent contradictions between passages in the Bible can be resolved by looking at some of the details scattered throughout the pages of God's Word and resulting in us receiving a clear understanding that completely removes the apparent contradiction. It also leads to an understanding that is clearly supported and substantiated by the Word of God through various models and on various layers or levels. If this is the first video that you have watched in the series, please stop this video now and start with part 1, as you will require the background that was given there in order to understand what will be discussed today. I have received a number of questions on the previous video that I will do my best to address in this series as part of the presentations, or where appropriate I will add a section to the end of a video in which I will answer some of these. I would like to avoid providing answers without going over the background that needs to be considered first, as there is so much to keep in mind when drawing conclusions about these matters. Previously, we saw how the first resurrection consists of three parts, or resurrection events, occurring on three separate days that are modeled after the biblical harvest and temple models, each also consisting of three parts and clearly associated with the first resurrection in at least three different instances. If the Bible refers to these three resurrection events as the first resurrection, there must logically be more harvests that we have to investigate, given that when something is said to be first, one would also expect subsequent events of the same nature that would be second and third, for instance. Today we will begin by looking at some of the aspects regarding the two remaining resurrection events that form part of the first resurrection, and how the Bible provides us with information that allows us to position them correctly on the timeline before us. These two remaining resurrection events are commonly referred to by Christians from four different perspectives, known as pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, pre-wrath, and post-tribulation views. However, we are not concerned about people's opinions on these matters, only on what is supported and clearly substantiated by the Word of God. As I have demonstrated in the first video, it is necessary to consider as much of God's Word as possible when studying a specific subject, as the Bible is designed in such a way that one cannot obtain a clear understanding of most subjects when considering only one or two passages. Our aim should always be to reach an understanding in which what we believe lines up with the Word of God in all aspects, and to do this properly one could spend weeks on sifting through information that addresses only one aspect in the Word of God. I will do my best to share some of this information in the series, hopefully in a systematic approach, in order to demonstrate the complexity involved and to point you to aspects that you can study in more depth on your own using these pointers. To do this, I will have to pause at various points to provide some supporting evidence for the points that I will make, so please bear with me as we do this. Some of the aspects that we need to consider to reach a position where we can correctly position these events on the timeline before us include identifying the different harvests and how they relate to each other, identifying the defining attributes of each harvest. In this video we will look only at the first resurrection. Qualifying attributes of people that belong to each harvest that are pointed out to us in the word. Specific qualities of each portion of the harvest as they are harvested and where these are mentioned in the word of God. The method with which each crop is harvested. The meaning of symbols that are used in the word of God. Some of the conditional statements that are made that separate the harvests from each other in the Bible that would lead to contradictions on the timeline if these are not considered. The purpose of specific dispensations and how the harvests fit into those. Timing of events as they are explained in various passages throughout the word. Historic events that are provided for us as a pattern to understand the time before us. We will not have enough time to cover all of these today, and I will, God willing, address more of these aspects in future videos as we continue. So let us start by looking at the first aspect, and this is what defines the different harvests. There have been many sermons on these, and what is clear to me from scripture is that there are at least three distinctive harvests that each follow a three-part pattern of first fruits, main harvest, and gleanings. These three harvests are normally referred to as the barley, wheat, and grape harvests. They also occur in the order of barley first, wheat second, and then grape last. As we are currently focused on the first resurrection, we will first look at obtaining a proper understanding of this harvest before moving on to the next. What does the Bible reveal to us regarding the attributes of the first harvest, also known as the barley harvest, of which Jesus and the Old Testament saints represent the first fruits? This is very important to understand because if we do not know what attributes define a harvest, 
we won't be able to differentiate between one harvest and another. I often see people confused about this and in combining the first fruits of two separate harvests because they have not studied the differences in attributes in detail. They would associate the 144,000 that are called the first fruits in Revelation with the resurrection of Jesus, who is also called the first fruits, when these are in fact two different harvests with very different attributes. I will point out the differences between these as we continue. Jesus' resurrection from the dead was the first instance in which people who lived on the earth received glorified resurrection bodies. There was no occurrence or other incident prior to his resurrection from the dead where this ever occurred. If we look at Jesus' attributes, who is said to be the first fruits of those that have slept, as explained to us in 1 Corinthians 15, what understanding do we receive regarding the attributes of the first resurrection from the word of God? But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. This passage does not tell us much on its own, but considering what the Word of God has to say about Jesus, it may be very difficult to clearly identify the correct attributes for this harvest by looking only at Jesus in light of what is explained in the following passage. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. According to this passage in Hebrews, and another from Psalms 40, which states the same, it may be very difficult to obtain a conclusive answer on this matter, as everything written in the Word of God points us to Jesus in one way or another. So when we look only at Jesus, we could face some ambiguity and difficulty in identifying the qualifying aspect of the first resurrection harvest. And this is why some combine the 144,000 mentioned in Revelation that are also called first fruits with the resurrection of Jesus, even though they have very different attributes pointed out to us in the Word of God when we search out the detail. We will also look at these as we continue. The Word of God further tells us in Matthew 27 verse 52 that there were many saints that arose with Jesus from the grave, and even though this passage is the only one clearly stating this fact, it is enough to understand that Jesus was not the only person resurrected from the dead as the first fruits of the harvest. As explained in the previous video, when we combine what is said about the body of Christ and the temple of God in 1 Corinthians with what Jesus said about raising the temple of his body, Jesus' statement on resurrecting the temple points to sections of his temple that he would resurrect on three separate resurrection days. We could also ask the following question to bring more clarity to this point or to look at Jesus' words from a different perspective. When Jesus was resurrected from the dead, was every person who would be part of his body and who are called his temple, when they have the Holy Spirit in them, resurrected into glorified bodies after he was in the grave for three days? The answer is a resounding no, but the Bible continues to show us that when we are saved through faith in Jesus, that we are sealed by a promise, looking forward to one of two remaining resurrection days, or one of the two redemption days on which two additional parts of the heavenly temple will reach completion. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, under the praise of his glory. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So Jesus and the Old Testament saints represent the most holy place of God's temple as explained in part 1, and John describes these people to us in the book of Revelation, where he also offers additional detail in his description that include the following. He refers to these people as 24 elders. They are positioned on thrones around the throne of God. They are clothed in white robes. They had golden crowns on their heads. They cast their crowns before the throne of God, taking no honor for themselves, but giving all the glory to God. The Lamb stood in the midst of the elders, painting the picture of a first-fruit sheaf to us. They fall down on their faces before the throne and worship God on many occasions. See how all of this information is conveyed in only three verses where we read the following. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne, and worship him that liveth for ever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, 
and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Now compare these attributes to what John describes when he mentions those that are resurrected, who are associated with the completion of the first resurrection, otherwise known as the gleanings of God's harvest. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and a judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. From these three passages we see the following. The final portion of this harvest, known as the corners of the field or the gleanings, and representing the outer court of God's temple, are seated on thrones, just like the elders. They are arrayed in white robes, just as the elders. But the explanation given to John would indicate that their robes were dirty, and had to be washed in the blood of the Lamb in order to become white again. This is an important aspect to remember. Once they are resurrected, they serve God day and night in His temple, just as the elders do. The Lamb who sits on the throne dwells among them, just as in the case of the elders. They receive crowns of life for being faithful unto death, once again just as the elders. Can you see how the two groups, even though they belong to different sections of the temple or harvest, and become part of the temple at different times and in different ways, have very similar attributes? This is exactly what we find in a harvest, an agricultural field containing a specific crop will have the same attributes apply to all three sections of the harvest. The only difference between the three sections are position in the field, timing of a specific section's harvest, and very importantly, the person responsible for harvesting that portion of the harvest. Just as the elders together with the lamb represent the first fruits of the first resurrection, those who are beheaded during the tribulation represent the gleanings of the first resurrection. They too become part of the heavenly temple and have the same attributes as the elders once they are glorified. However, we are provided with more information in the passages that we inspected that link the gleanings to several parables in which more qualities of those who become the gleanings of God's first harvest are described. Before we get to these qualities, let us first look at identifying the defining quality or attribute of the first resurrection. We discover this property when we consider what the Word of God says about the 24 elders. And the same quality is also assigned to the remaining parts of this harvest. We read the following important passage in Hebrews 11. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. These two passages clearly point out the main attribute that qualifies the elders to become part of the first fruits of the first resurrection. And when we consider this quality in the remaining two sections of the harvest, it repeats in both of the remaining parts as well. The Word of God even confirms the separation between this harvest and the next by pointing this specific quality out as the differentiating factor. I will show this to you as we continue. Now many may argue that it's conjecture to say that the elders mentioned in this passage represent the elders that John saw in heaven, when the writer of Hebrews is not specifically mentioned, or some would even say that the writer is completely unknown, even though Timothy is said to have penned it. 
Actually, all evidence points to Paul being responsible for this epistle to the Hebrews. The reason why we can know this is that Peter referred to Paul's epistle to the Hebrews in 2 Peter 3 verse 15, showing us that Paul did write a letter to the Hebrews that Peter himself read, being a Hebrew. Secondly, Paul is the only writer in the New Testament to end each of his letters, and not deviating from this pattern even once, with the phrase, Grace be with you. This is also how the epistle to Hebrews ends and clearly identifies Paul then as the writer of this epistle, as no other New Testament author used this phrase as Paul did. When we realize that Paul was the author of the epistle to the Hebrews, we also understand Paul's authority on this subject, given that he, just as John, was caught up into heaven and was shown many revelations as he explains in 2 Corinthians 12. One of the revelations that Paul would have received, given the information that is presented to us in Hebrews 11, would be the identity of the 24 elders, whom he would have seen around the throne of God, just as John did. Paul only shared specific information of what was revealed to him with believers, as instructed by our Heavenly Father, while he was told not to share other aspects regarding the revelation that were given to him. The identity of the 24 elders is one revelation that Paul does not specifically mention, but which is something that we can discover when applying Isaiah 28 verse 9 to 10 to our study of the Word of God. How that he was caught up into paradise, and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. We see the same situation applying to John, where John was given revelations about the end times, but was instructed to seal up certain aspects of what was shown to him, and not to reveal this to the reader, as can be seen in the following passage. When the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. The same situation also applied to Daniel, who was told to seal up an entire book, and not to make the information known, as it was intended for the end times. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. We are given three instances, and therefore a repeating pattern, in which people who received revelations from God were told not to share everything that was shown to them with those whom they would be sharing this with. This fits in with the way in which God designed His Word, ensuring that the information He wants us to discover is not given in a single passage, but requires us to search the Scriptures for every part that forms part of the final picture. So knowing then that having faith in Jesus as being the Son of God is the main attribute that defines the harvest that is known as the first resurrection, what else can we learn from Hebrews 11? Paul describes at least 16 people in person who had faith that was counted to them for righteousness. Some of them are from Israel, but those mentioned also include people like Rahab, which was a prostitute from a Gentile nation, and people who lived before Israel or Jacob was born and became the nation of Israel. This is the second defining attribute of this harvest, and that is that it does not focus on any specific nation or people group on the earth alone. Keep this in mind, as this is very important as well. How do these two attributes apply to the three sections of the harvest, and what does it tell us about each section? Also, how do these attributes distinguish the first resurrection from the next harvest that follows? The Old Testament saints are said to have had faith, but the word goes further to tell us that it is our faith in Jesus as being the Son of God that is the faith that saves us and with which God is pleased. We can have faith in many things, such as that the sun would rise in the east tomorrow at a specific time. But the Word of God says that we are saved through faith when we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus even goes as far as telling His disciples that this kind of faith is equal to doing the works of God. Then said they unto Him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on Him whom He hath sent. Evaluating the faith of the church in Revelation is also what Jesus does when addressing each of the seven churches when he speaks to those who have ears to hear and who are able to overcome the world. Revelation does not provide us with an exact definition of what it means to overcome the world, but John, who wrote the book of Revelation, provides the answer for us in 1 John chapter 5, where we read the following. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? 
In Hebrews 11 verse 6, we see that God requires us to have faith in Him and that He also desires us to search Him out and rewards those who do so diligently. These are all important clues that we need to keep in mind as we continue to study the subject of the harvests in order to avoid contradiction between our understanding and what the Word says. When we obtain this understanding, we see that the Old Testament saints must have had the most faith of all believers as they had only a future promise to base their faith on. There was no physical evidence for them to rely on as those would have who would live after the resurrection of Jesus. Some of these people may have had encounters with Jesus such as Abraham, Joshua, Moses and others that we can identify in scripture, but they had no idea of God's redemptive plan as we have it today. Those that came to faith in Jesus after his resurrection from the dead had many eyewitness accounts and historic documents, and today we have the completed word of God available to us to base our faith on when we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, who came to set us free from our sin. When we look at this carefully, we notice a decrease in the amount or the quality of people's faith as we move from the first fruits to the main harvest, and we can therefore anticipate that the gleanings of this harvest will have the least amount of faith in Jesus as being the Son of God. We will compare this anticipated quality with Scripture to see if our assumption lines up with the Word of God. This is also the reason why Jesus is evaluating the churches in the book of Revelation. It has to do with faith. In the passages from Revelation, in which the gleanings of God's first resurrection harvest are described to John, we see a number of additional attributes associated with this group that we need to keep in mind as we continue our study. These are given as follows. They experience hunger. They thirst. They are scorched by the sun, and it would seem to have lived while there was severe heat on the earth. This group is associated with tears and weeping. This final point is also very important as there are many passages and parables linked to this aspect of this group, which helps us to discover more about this group and that which will follow. When we examine what happens to the gleanings of a harvest, we know the following from Scripture. And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Of any three-part harvest, the owner of the field is only allowed to reap the first two portions. The third portion is intentionally left to what God refers to as the poor and the stranger. Now there are some questions that immediately come to mind when I encounter this passage, and the first is this. If the owner of the field is not allowed to harvest the corners, how can they become part of the resurrection process that applies to the first fruits and main harvest, for which the owner is responsible? It would seem that the owner is giving the corners of the field to others, and how would these then become part of his crop again? We know that the first fruits sanctify the rest of the crop, and the gleanings are therefore also holy to the Lord. But how does the Lord get the gleanings back into his barn after leaving it to the poor and the stranger? For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. How do these principles apply to people that are called members of his body, but who are part of the gleanings? Does the owner have to go to the poor or stranger and redeem those again that are already holy to him, or what should be done? This would seem to be a difficult question to find an answer to from the Word of God, but surprisingly a very clear and concise answer is given to us, as if our Heavenly Father expected us to ask this exact question. We read the following. Notwithstanding, no devoted thing that a man shall devote unto the Lord of all that he hath, both of man and beast, and of the field of his possession, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy unto the Lord. None devoted which shall be devoted of men shall be redeemed, but shall surely be put to death. Here we are provided a clear instruction on what has to be done to those who are sanctified, but who are left to the poor, since they cannot be redeemed a second time. And we see this confirmed in several places in Revelation, where those who form part of this section are shown to be put to death. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last which was dead and is alive. I know thy works, and tribulation, and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, 
and I will give thee a crown of life. This section of scripture paints a clear picture of what those who will have to be faithful unto death will face and who the poor will be that will be responsible for their deaths. Also note that those who are faithful unto death are part of the churches as we can see in this passage that clearly addresses members of the church of Smyrna and explaining events that they will have to face which are further clarified in the book of Revelation. This is very important to understand. More information about these people who are faithful unto death comes from Revelation 6, where their deaths are described to us. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also, and their brethren, that they should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. It would seem that these believers will be incarcerated and given ten days to make a decision, which would either result in their death through beheading, or an alternative that would be on offer to them. This alternative to death through beheading is shared with us in the description of their resurrection. And I saw thrones. And they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. People who belong to the gleanings will have to decide between taking the mark of the beast and worshipping the beast, being able to buy and sell as a result, and escaping the hunger and thirst that they will face, but losing their salvation in the process. These are all members of the Church of Smyrna. Those who exchange their faith in Jesus as the Son of God for the mark of the beast find themselves in a similar situation as Esau, who exchanged his firstborn right for a bowl of soup because of his hunger. This is one instance in which the Word of God clearly shows us how saved people can lose their salvation by betraying their faith in Jesus and replacing it with Satan's mark in their bodies. This is further confirmed in this passage from Revelation 3, where those who have soiled their white garments, which is another property of those who are the gleanings of God's harvest, are addressed. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father, and before his angels. Here we have another example where we see that God can blot out people's names from the book of life. Even though a person's name may have been written in the book, God can blot their name out if they exchange their birthright for a metaphoric bowl of soup. From these passages we understand that those who represent the gleanings of the first resurrection are required to remain faithful unto death, which would point to them not being in a position that would be associated with the main harvest when it is reaped. Hebrews 11 verse 1 tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for, and if the gleanings have the least amount of faith, they would also have the least amount of hope in things that those who are part of the main harvest hoped for. The gleanings, given their position in a crop, are the furthest away from the center, which would represent the first fruits. In Revelation 2 and 3, there are seven churches that are evaluated. Some are also warned about the consequences for being found wanting. As such, and by how Jesus is measuring the churches, the gleanings have an issue with overcoming at the time when the main harvest is reaped, and are therefore found to be positioned at the corners of the field. Since the gleanings are those who fail to be overcomers, our Heavenly Father, in His mercy, gives them a second chance, which requires them to remain faithful unto death. This property is also further affirmed in many of the parables that we will soon consider to elaborate on this. We have now highlighted some qualities of the first resurrection harvest, and shown that the gleanings have similar properties as the first fruits, and these are only a few of the aspects that could be pointed out. We still need to look at the differences between the gleanings and the main harvest, which we will do in the next video. We will also look at the two remaining resurrection events for the first resurrection as described in the Word of God. As I have said, there is so much information to consider regarding this topic that one could keep going for a very long time, and I apologize for only getting to some of these aspects today. However, in order to understand this without contradicting what the Word of God says, it has to be done thoroughly. I hope this information has helped you to unlock more of the hidden treasures in God's Word, 
as we continue on this journey of discovery. May our Heavenly Father bless you and keep you. Until next time.